Welcome to the Young Turks, Jake Ewer, David Schuster with us today. David, of course, the TYT contributor on Rebel HQ. Check out all his videos there. Uh, but I suspect you already have, uh, based on the view counts that I see. <laughs> <laughs> David. It's all those relatives, Jank. I got a lot of relatives across the United States, and they're all about TYT these days. Oh yeah, the the Schusters are a giant clan. Everybody knows that. <laughs> uh, so uh, Anna's out uh, this week because she was just at the Chamber of Commerce in Philadelphia uh, debating Ben Shapiro. So in the bonus episode for the members, do not miss that. I'm going to break down that debate, and that debate was. Awesome and shows exactly what progressives are about and exactly what conservatives are about. So don't miss that. I can't wait to break that down for you guys. But David's got tons of news for us about Republicans, Democrats, ex Republicans, and the list goes on. <laughs> so, David, take it away. Let's do it. Steve Bannon. Donald Trump's former chief strategist, remember him? Well, he is now urging conservatives to prepare for controlling. The United States government, here is Bannon on one of his most recent podcasts, watch. We're winning big in 2022, we're gonna win big in 2024, we need to get ready now, right? We control this country, we gotta start acting like it. And one way we're gonna act like it, we're not gonna have 4,000 ready to go, we're gonna have 20,000 ready to go, and we're gonna pick the 4,000 best and the most ready in every single department. Now, it sounds like it's a mere staffing plan for government bureaucrats, right? But it's actually a far more intense plan that Bannon is talking about. And here's why, quote, Bannon referred to 4,000 shock troops in an interview with NBC News on Saturday after the network reported that he had been earlier in the week with party faithful to prepare to, re to reconfigure government once a Republican is in the White House. If you're gonna take over the administrative state and deconstruct it, then you have to have shock troops prepared to take it over immediately. Bannon told NBC, I gave him fire and brimstone, according to the Huffington Post. Now, shock troops is a military term. It's often associated by historians with Nazi brown shirts during World War II. Uh, and when Brandon is there encouraging conservatives to take over the federal government with shock troops, he's also been talking not just about the federal government, but also local governments. And so across the United States, you have tons of MAGA faithful who are now essentially infiltrating school boards, running for local office, which is the right, of course, but it is making local politics even more extreme and more divisive. Shock troops, Jack. Yeah. So the context is so important here. So, you know, he has a show called War Room. That's not a big deal. Um, we, we used to have a show uh, on current TV um, uh, called War Room. So, that, that's standard fare, uh, the situation room. It's no problem, okay? When you talk about, hey, when you come into government, make sure you're prepared uh, with your set of bureaucrats to replace the old bureaucrats because you don't want to lose any time. No problem if a progressive was going in to office, I would tell them to be prepared for in a similar way because right now it's filled by you know uh, establishment folks. Now, uh, so where are the issues? The issues are significant. Number one, when we, you start using the word shock troops, especially within the context of January 6th, and when you start talking about reconfiguring the government, and you talk about that in the context of, well, we didn't like that Joe Biden won the election. Um, so on January 6th, we wanted Mike Pence, the vice president, just simply to declare Trump the president. Well, that's reconfiguring government in a completely different way. That's re reconfiguring the democracy out of the government. When you make an allusion to shock troops, you're being more clear saying, no, no, we're not looking to, to more efficiently run the government and in a way that it comports with our ideology because we won the election in that circumstance. You're saying, no, we're looking to basically deconstruct, and he says it, deconstruct the government. And, and he says it also in that, in that speech about how there's more of us than there are these soy boys. And what he's referring to there is, we're stronger, we can muscle them. Now that's not true, but that's the reference to soy boys. The other side is weak. They will not oppose us if we bring in our shock troops and do whatever we gotta do to reconfigure this government to one where we have permanent power. And the way you do that is by getting rid of democracy. So um, if he just stuck with the old name of his show, etc., it would be one thing. 
But when he starts talking about these shock troops after we saw January 6, after we know that they hated when they lost and they tried to rip down democracy, understand if they quote unquote get elected another time. This is Steve Bannon saying, don't expect the same government after we're done because we're not gonna be done. We're gonna dis basically deconstruct what America used to be and we're going to go in an authoritarian direction. And keep in mind, I mean, Steve Bannon, he's not, say, some expert on government bureaucracies. He's not with the Office of Management and Budget, or he's never been. He is a communications specialist. He is a media specialist, according to his own description. This is a term I think Jen deliberately used to not only inspire the fringe, but also to prepare them for that message that Donald Trump said on January 6th, you have to show strength. And at a time when America is already so divided and the extreme, particularly on the right, already has these sort of violent illusions and real violence, as we've been talking about, for Steve Bannon to essentially pour gasoline on the flames and say, "Oh yeah, Shock troops, that's an appropriate term. No, it's not about staffing the government. This is about actually using violence, using raw power if necessary to force your will, not only on the government at the federal level, but also at the local level, at the state level. And oh, by the way, there are a lot of Trumpists who are also now looking to try to run for secretaries of state so that they can run the elections in whatever sort of violent way they want to deny people the right to vote and to make sure that votes are only counted in a certain way. Yeah, that leaves some more context. So Stephanie Grisham. Um, uh, used to be the uh, uh, first lady's uh, chief of staff, and she was also a uh, White House spokesperson for a brief period of time. So she worked with Trump for six years. Now she's got a book out. We're going to talk more about it later in the show. But she had an interesting explanation about uh, Trump's interactions with Putin because it, it seemed like Putin was trying to play with his mind. And I said her revelations actually, in an interesting way, to me show that Trump might not be controlled by Putin. Because if you already had compromise on, on Trump and you already controlled him completely, you wouldn't need to play these games that Grisham explained about bringing an attractive uh, translator and coughing on him and all these stuff. And so I wondered, and you heard me if you watched that episode of TYT, wonder, well then, why does Trump bow his head to Putin so much? It's bizarre, right? And uh, and Grisham had an explanation on ABC recently, where she said he just loves strong men, and he thinks that's the right way to go. He would constantly be talking about how strong Putin was, how strong Erdogan was in Turkey, how strong uh, she is in China. She he once asked her, "Who do you?" Th While well, Erdogan's in the room, who do you think stronger, Erdogan or she? Oh, they're so strong. You remember when he talked about North Korea? It was great because whenever the leader says something, everybody has to stand up and applaud. Uh, and and so he just does not believe in democracy. He believes in strong men uh, and dictatorship and authoritarian government. And so when in that context, when Steve Bannon goes, oh, we have to get ready for shock troops and completely uh, you know, deconstruct our government and basically disfigure our government. It's not it's not that subtle in terms of what what he's alluding to. And then. But you know, I'm glad that David brought up the school boards and the and and all the things that are happening there. Now, running for school board, of course, of course, Republicans can run for school board. I don't care how crazy they are, or what opinions they have. It's a democracy. Of course, you run, right? That's the right way to do it, the healthy political way to do it. That's how we do it in America. But when they go and they threaten violence, and now Merrick Garland at the Justice Department is drawing a line on that. We'll have that later in the program. Uh, but when they threaten violence, you have to draw the line as the government. Because if you don't, then you lead to anarchy, chaos, rule of law dissipates. And that is the thing that, that the right wing authoritarian fans want. Uh, they want a breakdown of law and order so that the vigilantes that they have can threaten violence all across the country and inside the government if they ever capture it again at the federal level. And, and then rule in the way that they want to, which is not our system of government, but a new system of government with shock troops and uh, and and a government we won't recognize. And so th this constant threat of violence, whether it's January 6th, you see it almost every day in the news. Uh, people going down with zip ties to try to arrest a female principal in their mind and a citizen's arrest for doing something simple like taking a kid who has COVID out of the school, etc. No, no, guys, they, they, they're afraid 
that the next election might be their very last chance of ever winning in a democracy again. And, and so if they win, they're gonna look to end it. If you thought you were ascendant and that you had the majority in this country, well, then you wouldn't have to be talking against democracy. You wouldn't have to be talking about shock troops. You wouldn't have to be talking about any of this. You only do that if you think you've lost and you've lost for good. So you're gonna trash our former government for a new one. And that is the scary proposition that the right wing has now. And every time they cross a new line, David, then they go, whoa, 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 it's no big deal, it's no big deal. You guys are over interpreting. Yeah. I mean, so soon they'll be talking about brown shirts and go, oh, no, no, we just meant shirts that are brown. You guys are, you know, <laughs> misinterpreting what we're saying. Oh, and Jenkins, it ties right in with, you know, I'm so glad that you raised Stephanie Grisham because the other part about the her ABC interview that stuck out to me is when she talked about that if Trump wins, a second term for Donald Trump, his governance would be all about revenge. He would be not constrained in the least because he's not running for reelection. He would implement all kinds of policies against Republicans that crossed him, certainly against Democrats and progressives. There would be nothing holding him back. And so when you have that sort of crazy future to look at if Trump actually runs and does win, and you combine that with the violent rhetoric that we're seeing, seeing from Steve Bannon and others, and this idea of people infiltrating school boards and local elections and how ballots are counted, um, it gets to be really frightening because there's there's no control. There's no control over these people. And, and I'm so glad, Jen, that you also mentioned school boards. Here in Connecticut, where I live, there was an effort, all of us, about every month now, we get a mailing. And it basically decries critical race theory, which is not being taught in the local schools. And when people look at, well, where is this stuff coming from? It is coming from a PO box in Florida, an organization that was started basically to get people riled up to try to divide this town. And that's happening everywhere because there is this idea from the likes of Steve Bannon and Donald Trump. It's not enough just to you know tear apart the federal government. You also have to tear apart local government as well. Um, look. I hope this is one of those things that I don't come back on and tell you guys. We warned you, it's, we've done that now dozens of times over 20 years of the Young Turks. And unfortunately, we've been proven right almost every time from Republican to Democratic administrations. And and I, I warned that Obama was going to be way too much in favor of corporations. Uh, as soon as he got into office because he was taking those actions. And I remember the Democrats yelling at me, how dare you, the beloved knighted Obama, there's no way he's gonna do that. And by the end, people had recognized, yes, yes, he largely did uh, uh, what corporations wanted and there was not very much a real reform of the government at all. I just give you that as a small example, but I give you dozens of examples. But this one is a warning we cannot recover from. If they seize control of the federal government again, I, I honestly think we're done. They, they, Bannon gets it. They're not. The last election is the last one for them. The demographic change is too much. Uh, Trump and the Republicans are too unpopular. Their only hope is an electoral college victory on one last election. After that, I mean, look, they've lost seven out of the eight uh, last popular votes in in uh, at the presidential level to begin with, <laughs> and now. Uh, it looks like they're down to 40% of the population and dropping. So there is, with Trump, if you don't see by now that there are no bounds, he, he will, he does like stop projecting your decency and your love of this country onto Trump. He has neither. He would end this country and our former government in a second if he thought it was to his advantage. And what Ban is telling you now is, yes, it's to our advantage. That is why we're getting our troops ready to come and destroy the government that we all know. All right, let's go to the next story. And this one is remarkable. Madison Cawthor, the Republican Congressman from North Carolina, he is now calling for a holy war. He recently spoke to Christian conservatives in North Carolina and posted the video of his remarks with some images overlaid and edited in, watch. I feel a spiritual battle going on on Capitol Hill. The only way that we take our country back is when strong, God-fearing patriots decide it is time for us to stand up and say no to your tyranny. Now is a time for our pastors and our congregations, like this one here, like many of you that you represent. It's time for us to stand up and declare boldly 
that as men and women of faith, we have a duty to stand against tyranny. We have a duty to be civically involved. We have a duty to save this country for the next generation. Back into the Old Testament. Look at David. Look at Daniel. Look at Esther. Look at all of these people who influenced the governments of their day to uphold Christian principles. Anybody want to tell him? Anybody? <laughs> well, Madison Cawthorn, clearly not the best and brightest. As Daily Coast wrote, even one who isn't Christian knows that no one in the Old Testament was fighting to uphold Christian principles. Christ wasn't even born at the time of the Old Testament, which is based on the Hebrew Bible or the Torah. Um, Jack, I'm, I'm just, you know, this one, look, you want to call for a holy war, you want to call for a spiritual awakening, that's fine. But you at least have to have some credibility on the most basic facts about the Bible. Yeah, who are we taking the country over for? Is it the folks in the Old Testament, the folks in the New Testament? I think he's got to make up his mind. And guys, if you're not convinced yet of how absurd that statement was, and we'll get back to the the fact that it's dangerous, which is the more relevant part of this conversation. But let's keep making fun of Cawthorn for one more second. Um, Muslims believe that the Quran is the third book. They think Old Testament, New Testament, and the Quran. So uh, a lot of you might not know this. Uh, it's not often talked about in the press in America, but Muslims believe that Jesus was a, a prophet of Allah, God. Allah just means God. And they, th they also believe in Moses, Abraham, and they think that Muhammad is in that lineage. So it would be like a, a Muslim preacher or a politician coming on and saying, look, Jesus and Moses and all these people were uh, obviously trying to uphold Muslim principles. Well, okay, they might be in the same lineage, but they certainly wouldn't be upholding Muslim principles because Islam did not yet exist, even if you believe in Islam, right? So it's just absurd and it's comically wrong. But you know, probably, I don't know that anybody in the audience even recognized it. Because I, look, let's be honest, evangelical Christians don't even read the Bible. They just take whatever hatred the preacher says and they run with it. If they read the Bible, they would know. Uh, that Jesus was not in favor of the rich. He said the rich have no chance of getting into heaven. That a camel has a, a better chance of passing through the eye of a needle and I can go on and on. If they actually read the Bible, these right wing evangelicals would be the most progressive socialists in the country. Read your own Bible. Okay, now to the dangerous part. Look, David, uh, when you start talking about holy war and he's saying we gotta take the country back for uh, Christianity. That's a bigger misunderstanding if you can call it that, right? No, the Constitution clearly says we shall not establish a religion. In fact, it was revolutionary, literally revolutionary that the founders of America were the first country to say, no, we will not be ruled by any religion. And that's why America was so interesting, so different. And arguably the shining city on a hill with all of its blemishes, it still said, you know, we're all gonna get along here. Whether you're a Jewish, Christian, different sects of Christianity, which is so important. And they even said the Mohammedans, that's what they used to call Muslims. Anyone could be an American, that's why America's such a great idea. But now the modern day, you know, Christian Taliban or whatever you wanna call them, the Cawthorns of the world say, Nah, we don't like the Constitution. Constitution is no good. Let's be a theocracy, uh, like in the bad old days, and pick one of the sects of Christianity. I'm not sure which one. Maybe the Jewish one. Uh, <laughs> maybe we go back to the Old Testament, and we'll make them the rulers of the rest of us. And I mean, I, to me, Jake, I just I'm just, I'm constantly shocked that a guy like Madison Cawthorn, which obviously he's got no shame, but also the groups that continually invite him to speak, given the mistakes like this that that he makes. I mean, and oh by the way, you mentioned well, you know, evangelical Christians don't really read the Bible, otherwise they would be democratic socialists. Well, clearly they also don't read newspapers because Madison Cawthorn has been alleged repeatedly to have essentially engaged in sexual harassment of several women. So it's not as if he's actually living a Christian life according to these women. And again, this idea that Christianity and that Christians have somehow remained in the shadows in the United States, as he says, it is simply absurd. And then when he talks about, well, certain principles are being threatened. Well, what, what principles are being threatened? Vaccines, science, yeah, I would argue, sure, science and basic facts, truth, 
that is being threatened thanks to people like Madison Cawthorn and these crazies on the right who give them these platforms. Yeah, look, uh, I grew up a uh, secular Muslim. I, I'm now atheist, but um, we believed that Islam should not rule Turkey, where I'm from. And luckily, it doesn't, although Erdogan has now headed in that direction. Uh, and, and we fight against that because we've seen how that movie plays out. When one religion rules everyone else, it doesn't rule based on logic or science, it rules based on at a best case scenario, all rules from 2000 years ago. In a worst case scenario, it's all an excuse for authoritarian government, put a strong man in charge, have him oppress everyone else, rob them of their freedom under the guise of religion. That is how it turns out every single time. And so, no, we're not gonna go back to those days. And, and him calling for this kind of holy war is outrageous. But unfortunately, for the right wing, they don't think it's outrageous at all. They, they, I think a giant percentage of them actually believe that we are a theocracy, that we should be ruled by Christianity. Now, I don't think anyone's ever thought through which sect. Should, should it be the Episcopalians, the Lutherans, the Evangelicals, the Catholics? The only people who thought it through are the Evangelicals who are like, yeah, it's us, us, we rule, we rule, not any of the rest of you. Uh, that's because they're not interested in God or holiness or Christianity. They're interested in raw power. And look, if they were David, I mean, you talk about his ignorance of his own religion, but and and his hypocrisy towards that religion with the accusations against them. But look at who right wing evangelicals love in this country: Donald Trump, guy who had slept with multiple porn stars while he was married to his what was his third wife. I honestly lost track. Yes, third wife. Okay, and and it gra bragged about sexual assaults, uh, and then and then goes in front of a religious audience and goes, "Yeah, I like the two Corinthians." No, that's no, that's not how they re referred to Corinth. And everybody's like awkward. And he's like, and he looks at the crowd and he was like, "What? What? What? Isn't that how you say it?" It's so obvious, he doesn't know what's in the Bible. He's never looked at it in his life, he's never gone to church. He doesn't care about Christianity at all. You're praying to a false prophet. He's almost a literal golden calf. He's not a calf, but if he could, he would certainly create a golden calf and call it Trump calf, right? And, and this so-called billionaire that brags about his golden palaces are the guys that is the guy that you're praying to. It is the exact opposite of what Jesus preached. So I'm not at all surprised that Cawthorn is not called out by the right wing. They don't. They have no idea what's in the Bible. They have no idea what Jesus stood for. So when this jackass says, "Ah, let's ruin America, destroy what it stands for, and turn it into a religious cult uh, like the Taliban did in Afghanistan." Republicans cheer, they stand up and go, yes, yes, our version of the Taliban is awesome. Screw America and its secular nature is not establishing a religion. I don't know what the founding fathers were thinking. Burn the Constitution, let's get ruled by the Bible, whichever one we make up. And sadly, I mean, the polling is also moving in that direction, right? I mean, polls show that a growing number of Republicans now support using violence to force Donald Trump back into office if necessary. A majority believe that the election was stolen. And I think, Jack, if you, if you polled people and, and, and they were honest about it, I think if you gave them a choice between, okay, do you want a democracy where sometimes you'll win, sometimes you lose, or do you wanna force your religious views and your political views down everybody's throats no matter what, most Republicans, I'm convinced, would choose the latter. They would be happy to have a theocracy where their willpower is forced down everybody else. And that's why I, you know, I get so freaked out over, you know, January 6th would be a hell of a lot different if Republicans had control of the House and the Senate on that day. Would the Democrats have been able to get Joe Biden certified? I, I sometimes wonder, and I certainly think that won't be the case in 2024 if Democrats don't have a majority in the House and Senate. I can see Republicans marching in lockstep saying, nope, we're gonna deny democracy because we want our guy to win and that's how it's gonna be. Yeah, look, honestly, this is what's among the things that separates TYT from the rest of the media. Because the mainstream media would be scared to death to actually quote the Bible to you. Jesus said, give away all of your worldly possessions and follow me. What is the exact opposite of capitalism? The exact opposite 
of capitalism. By the way, I don't agree with Jesus. <laughs> I'm an atheist and I don't want to give away my worldly possessions. I'm not anywhere near as progressive as Jesus. But they won't ever say it. And they and and so and they play patty cakes with these guys. Oh, they said the magic word religion, Christianity, run, run. Don't ever challenge them on any of this. No. The media needs to be honest and clear. In the Constitution, it very clearly says we shall not establish a religion and there shall be no religious tests for office in this country. Say it loud and say it proud. Don't be afraid of being right. All right, we got to take a break. And on this show, we fight back against the monsters in the right wing. We don't sit around and play patty cakes with them. All right, when we come back, more of that. Uh, and then, like I said in the bonus episode, this is a great day to become a member. Uh, ben Shapiro versus Anna Kasparian. I'm gonna break down that debate. You guys are gonna love it. Hit the join button below or tyt.com slash join. We'll be right back. All right, back on TYT, Cenk and David with you today. Uh, David's got more news. Cenk, let's get right to it. That would include immigration and citizenship for people to be protected, like me and many others. Can you commit to that, Senator? Just a simple question. And that was Karina Ruiz trying to confront Arizona Senator Kirsten Sinema on a plane back to Washington DC on Monday. Uh, Ruiz says that uh, she is a DACA recipient who once volunteered to help elect Sinema. Now she wants Sinema to deliver on her election promises. Uh, the interaction continues with Ruiz looking for answers and Sinema looking like she wants to be anywhere else. Here it is. Yeah, so Ruiz talks about how her father passed away. And even with that, Cinema would not respond with any sort of words. Well, upon landing in Washington, DC, there was a different activist who approached Kirsten Cinema. And conveniently, Cinema seemed to get a phone call in the middle of this interaction. Watch. Not exactly a profile and courage there by Kirsten Cinema. She could have just said, you know what, I don't want to talk about this, but she wouldn't even give that woman the respect of any sort of response. And this has, of course, triggered a huge debate, political media circles, Jenk, about when is the appropriate time or not, if you are an ordinary citizen or you're a journalist, to actually stop a senator and say, look, you haven't outlined what your priorities are, you haven't said what you're going to cut, give me some information, give me an answer. Your thoughts? Well, I think that this is damning of both um, our politicians and our media. Um, now, if we had a functioning media in this country, well, the reporters would ask those questions. And, and, and if we had a functioning uh, government in this country, politicians would have to answer uh, reporters' questions. But none of that happens. So now look, guys, in the beginning, uh, yesterday we talked about uh, Senator Sinema got confronted in a bathroom, and that gave everyone in power an easy out. They all came and upbraided everyone and said, "Oh, how dare you, you know, this is, you can't go into a, a, person, a, person, a bathroom with someone and invade a person's privacy, etc. Now, yesterday on the show, we gave you nuance. Uh, uh, John said it was fine. I thought, no, don't follow them into the bathroom, but you should definitely ask them questions in almost everywhere else. And boom, today they deliver. They asked them at the airport. That is perfectly legitimate. Ask him on the airplane, perfectly legitimate. So what's the excuse now for the people in power? They don't have an excuse. And look guys, you all know it. 
If Karina Ruiz had come in with a $2,800 check, cinema would have been all ears. In fact, the reason she's on that plane is because she flew back to Arizona. She gave a very weak excuse of, "Oh, I have something wrong with my foot. She seemed to be walking fine there in that video, right? I can't see anything wrong with her foot. But of course, what we discovered was that she had a massive fundraiser in Arizona. So she went to talk to people who wrote her thousand dollar checks. But if you try to talk to her and you're an actual constituent, a voter, a volunteer who tried to help her before, she's got no interest in you and she's not gonna to talk to you under any circumstance. And by the way, guys, sometimes people are off-putting, sometimes they threaten things they shouldn't threaten, etc. It doesn't mean that you have to engage in an hour long conversation or debate, but a minimum of some sort of politeness looking into someone's eyes. I honestly, I've never had an interaction with another person where they wouldn't even look at you while you were talking to them other than Keith Overman. So this is the second time I've ever seen that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it should look, it shows you know, people have, I guess, their own sort of social anxieties or whatever that may have been the case with Keith. But in Cinema's case, I mean, it shows a basic lack of uh, that she's not ready for prime time, that she should not be a US senator. She should not be at this level. She doesn't have the ability to say, look, I'm not going to comment. You can hector me, you can question me. I'm just not going to be able to say anything to you. She should at least be able to go that far. And you know, on the media side of this, I mean, I used to you know have this sort of arrangement where where, where they were chasing you know Gary Condit, who was accused in the Chandra Levy case years ago, or whether it was Ken Starr or in the Independent Council investigation. If somebody didn't want to comment, I would say to them, look. You say on camera, sorry, we're not gonna comment on this or we're gonna badger you, we're gonna hector you, we're gonna follow you at the end of your driveway when you're taking up the trash. We're gonna follow you across the Capitol, Congressman Condit. So you, as a, as a responsible reporter who had respect for the people I was covering, say you choose. You want me to hector you and follow you? That's fine, it makes for great television. And most of the people who are professionals would say, okay, let's do this. You have your camera waiting at the end of the hallway. I'm gonna show up, you throw whatever you wanna say, and I'm just gonna say no comment. Will that be enough? Okay, at least the politician, the, the newsmaker is on the record saying they're not gonna comment. Uh, but that's, you know, and that, that may be, you know, irresponsible and depending on the story, but it's a lot better than not doing anything. Because when you don't do anything, in my view, you start to get journalists, activists who are gonna follow you, not just in airplanes, but also into the bathroom. And and I would have said to Senator Cinema, look, I'm gonna follow you into that bathroom unless you are willing to come out of that bathroom and stop and say something. You can't just say absolutely nothing. And, and the fact that she says absolutely nothing makes to me underscores that she is not, she's not at the professional, sophisticated level, the savvy level you would expect of a member of the US Senate. Yeah, but and and more than that, even David, it's she has disdain for her voters. Right. For the average American. And you remember that picture of her wearing the F off ring? Um, now, of course, she never wore that ring when she went to a fundraiser. She would never be that disrespectful to someone bribing her. But to her voters, she wore an F off ring, took a picture, put it on Instagram uh, to kind of rub it in people's face. This was the physical manifestation of that ring. And so, the message is loud and clear that, by the way, why do you think there's polls that shows that Congress is among the most unpopular institutions in the whole country, along with the media? Because from the people in power, we get this constant disrespect. You don't mean anything to me, your questions are useless, and I'm never going to answer them. I only answer to the people who pay me. We set up a deeply corrupt system that has disdain for all of us. We shouldn't be surprised that we get senators like Cinema out of that system. It was built to create senators like Cinema who only answer to their donors and not to their voters. And I would argue, Jenk, that cinema is even worse than Mansion. I mean, a lot of people say, "Oh, Mansion and cinema they go together." Go together. At least with Mansion, Mansion is stopping and talking to reporters and saying, "Here's my baseline number." You may not agree with it, and he will say, "Here's what I think should be cut from the 3.5 trillion dollar package to get it down to 1.5 trillion." Cinema won't say anything. She won't say anything to the press. She won't say anything to her constituents. She's not saying anything to the White House about she's willing to cut. And when she does talk to her donors, she's also not going into any sort of details. She's just speaking in platitudes. And 
you know, as somebody who cares about holding people accountable, I'm right there with you. I think that there should be a dozen journalists chasing her through the airport, wherever she goes now, sticking a microphone in her face and peppering her with these questions. And when she gets sick of being peppered with questions and sick of being hectored, she'll finally realize, okay, maybe I do have to say something and maybe I do need to outline some basic principles that would be better than nothing. And and unfortunately, cinema only responds to power. So again, if you're a donor, she will take your call instantly. That's a fact. There's no question about that. She's gone fundraiser to fundraiser throughout this entire negotiation. And after she voted against the minimum wage theatrically with that swivel thumbs down, she went directly to the National Restaurant Association and collected legalized bribes. And so she doesn't mind putting on a show. She doesn't mind answering to people. She just doesn't want to answer to you. I, I agree with you 100%. Uh, and I just, you know, at some point, you know, maybe some Democrat or some progressive will say, okay, here's the receipt of the check that I gave you in my last election. Uh, here's the pay stub or whatever it is. And you say, now I want you to explain something to me. Um, and if that's what it takes now to try to get an answer, okay, that'll be the next step. And I'm sure there's a Democratic donor in Arizona or somewhere around the country who's gonna say, I'm not happy with Kristen Cinema. She's not talking to her regular voters and citizens and journalists. But she damn well better talk to me after I gave her $2,800 or whatever the max was in the last election. And that person's gonna go up to her and also have a phone recording this. And that's gonna be an even more embarrassing conversation for Kirsten Cinema because then the two worlds are gonna collide, both the corruption and the bribery and the fact that she's trying to hide from people. Yeah, last thing on this. Look, they, the people in power always have some excuse and that includes the people in mainstream media. So they say, oh well, don't go to their house. Okay, fair, I agree. Don't go to the bathrooms, fair, I agree. Okay, then they say, don't yell at them. Okay, well, what do you mean by yelling? Well, don't go across them in restaurants. Don't do it at an airport. Don't do it on an airplane. Okay, why don't you just say don't do it, right? And and if the reporters aren't going to do it, and you won't let any of the citizens do it, are the only people allowed to talk to politicians in this country their donors? That's an absurd standard. It's an absurd standard. And again, normally people wouldn't have to take this into their own hands. And in, unlike the right wing, they're like, oh, let's take the law into our own hands and do violence. No, you cannot get any more polite than Karina Ruiz was in that video or the other person at the airport. They're not taking the law into their own hands. They're asking perfectly legitimate political questions. They're asking them in a perfectly polite way. And, and, and the whole country wants to know. And still the people in power go, well, we don't like it. We don't like the people without power bothering the people with power. And remember the press was supposed to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Does it look that way? All right, so we're gonna take a quick break here. When we come back, more drama along these lines. And during the social break, you guys have awesome comments too. So I can't wait to get to those, we'll be right back. Back on TYT, Jenk and David with you guys. David Aphasia wrote in on Twitch. I'm just going to read one comment because it's fun about how we could, you know, intimidate the other side. He said, Jenk should just hang outside of Mar a Lago and flex his triceps. <laughs> now that's an idea. Although, to be fair, that might be a little too intimidating. You know, I don't want him to look, oh my God, I know he's going to bring guns. <laughs> Don't encourage me, David, don't encourage me. Okay, now to the other David who's got news for us. And Jenk, let's get right back to it. Think about getting it because if you're my age, I didn't tell you to get it, you don't think about it. 
that was South Carolina Republican Senator Lindsey Graham. He was embracing vaccines in front of a crowd of Republicans only to have them jeer and boo him. After a man identified himself as a civilian employee of the Navy and complained that he was about to lose his job because of the military's vaccine mandate. Well, Graham's tone embracing the vaccine, it seemed to change, watch. 92% of the people in the hospitals in South Carolina are vaccinated. Oh, 92%, 92%, 92%, 92%, 92%, 92%, 92%, 92%, 92%, 92%, 92%, 92%, 92%, 92%, 92%, 92%, 92%, 92%, 92%, 92%, 92%, 92%, 92%, 92%,
to get vaccinated. Again, it's the loud, small minority with some perhaps support from law enforcement um, that is causing a ruckus and making life miserable for anybody who believes in truth and science and basic facts. Jack. Yeah, so the, the, every part of that story was amazing. Let's start with Lindsey Graham. You, what you saw there was live action politician changing his stance uh, like a weasel right in front of your eyes. Right now, by the way, I'll give ironic credit to Lindsey Graham. He started off trying to tell them the truth. He's giving them correct stats about the 92%. He's telling them, hey, you already took the vaccine for measles, which is all that is true, right? And uh, but as soon as they start booing him, like the weaselly politician that he is, he's like, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm with you guys. I'm against the mandates. I can't believe the army's doing this. The army's so dumb, right? Now, this is a guy who's been uh, kissing the army's ass uh, the entire time he's been in office. Uh, the solution to everything was the army, military, of war, invasions, etc. Now, they yell at him a little bit and he's like, oh, yeah, the army's stupid, right? And, and look, guys, this is the circle of hate and you can tell now Graham is one of the biggest ass kissers for Donald Trump so they should love him but it was Trump himself that got booed in Alabama so that tells you that's actually not the root cause the root cause is conservative media so conservative media starts the cycle of ignorance hatred and fear then it goes to the actual voters that watch that media and they get amped up on conspiracy theories, lies, you name it. Oh, measles is totally vaccination is totally different than coronavirus vaccination. Really? How? How? It's you. We've had mandated vaccinations in this country forever uh, for every kind of disease you could imagine, and no one ever objected. And now all of a sudden they object to this because they want to create political trouble. They want to do cultural wars. That's what Tucker Carlson wants to do. That's what the right wing media wants to do. And now all of a sudden they all get brainwashed and the cult comes out and the zombies attack the politicians. And then you see the Republican politicians with your own eyes, both Graham and Trump, change right in the middle of uh, of speaking, they, they're basically A-B testing. They go from emphasizing, hey, maybe you should get the vaccine so you don't die. To ah, screw it, die. I don't care. Oh, uh, yeah, freedom. Yeah, I mean, no, no, no mandates. Freedom. Yeah, oh, hey, oh, freedom. Okay. So it's not the politicians driving it; it's the media driving the voters, which then drive the politicians to do what they're doing. So the Republican politicians are hopeless. It doesn't matter if they try to do the right thing; they're just going to get primaried out of existence by the zombies, the zombies that Fox News and other right-wing outlets created. And now, when you turn to the uh, other stories in New York. Look, uh, whenever anyone, like I've seen left wing protesters at oil pipeline protests and others uh, get mauled by police, just absolutely pummeled, right? And then they pass laws saying, hey, maybe we should be allowed to run them over in the streets. That's actually literal. It happened in Florida, they tried it in, in the Dakotas. And, and, but when it's protesters that apparently the cops are sympathetic to, um, they're like, oh yeah, trash a healthcare tent, someone where people can actually get tested to make sure not only that they're okay, but that they're not spreading the disease all across New York. Oh, smash it to pieces, great, no problem, you're free to go, move along, move along. If left wing protesters did that to anything that was related to a corporation, we'd get our ass handed to us by the cops. They would brutalize us. But the other side does it all, oh, yeah, a fist bumps for everybody. Now, I don't know that the fire guys are related to the cops or that tent, but obviously those particular guys had tremendous sympathy for the anti-vaxxers. And then finally, should the people in hospitals be fired if they're not taking the vaccine? Of course, they're working in hospitals, they're gonna get people sick. It's like saying, oh no, freedom. But wait a minute, don't you have to wear a mask in surgery? You remember that's been the case your whole life. You see the doctors and the nurses when they're in surgery in order to be clean and not to pass germs onto a patient that's a lot of times whose body's opened up and is more vulnerable, they wear masks. Now if a doctor or nurse said, "Oh, well, I got my freedom to not wear a mask and spit inside the guy, you would be fired, obviously. And you don't have the right to spread disease, especially if you're a healthcare worker, but no, the right wing media has convinced the zombies, no, my have the freedom to hurt you physically.
And that freedom comes with a price because we just passed, according to all the data, 700,000 people killed in the United States from COVID-19. The daily death toll is still averaging 1,800 a day. So, you know, look, as we all think, well, maybe it's getting a little bit better. It's certainly better than it was six or seven months ago. But again, 90 to 95 percent of the people who are showing up at hospitals, 99 percent of the people who are dying are people who were not vaccinated, who are now taking up space for your grandmother, your grandfather, your brother, your sister, whoever it is who has a heart attack, who needs cancer treatment, who breaks a bone. Good luck trying to find a hospital bed right now in Alabama, Mississippi, some of these other states. And oh, by the way, in these states, more people died last year from COVID-19 than were born. So the population is also getting smaller. By the way, David, the madness is gonna spread because right-wing media is, they're monsters. So now that they're against this vaccine, are you sure they're not gonna say all of a sudden polio, polio kicks ass. Forget, oh, that, that's anti-freedom to be against, uh, to, to take the polio vaccine. Or the black death vaccine, plague vaccine, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. No, the freedom thing to do is take all of your diseases and smear it on other people. We're not taking any more vaccines. And, and don't. And by the way, tell your doctor don't wash those instruments after you've done the surgery. Don't wear the mask as you said. And by the way, you know don't wash your hands either after you go to the bathroom and then you do the the surgery on me because freedom for the doctors means their freedom to spread whatever bacteria into you. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't have to make sense it, because it, it's so easy to brainwash the right wing. You just can't have uh, all of their hosts scream at once freedom. And they don't think, hey, let me analyze this. What do you mean freedom? Freedom obviously has bounds. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater. I don't have the uh, freedom to swing my arm into your face. Nope, the minute you say the word freedom, they're like, me want freedom. Me hurt other people for freedom. Me get disease and die. Take up hospital space for freedom. No, that's not part of freedom. Look, are you insane? We're progressives, of course we're in favor of freedom. We want freedom more than anybody else does. We don't wanna be ruled by right wing authoritarian thugs like Trump and Steve Bannon, etc. We don't wanna be ruled by you. Tucker Carlson's a nut job telling people, oh yeah, if, oh, if Biden gets elected, they're gonna make you drink Starbucks every day. He literally said that. Are you drinking Starbucks? Did the government mandate that you drink Starbucks every day? Looney Tunes, absolutely nuts. And they go, oh yeah, they're gonna do it. They said that Obama was gonna put you in FEMA camps, he never did. None of the conspiracy, conspiracy theories ever proved to be true. And nonetheless, they still believe it the next time, it doesn't matter. QAnon said Trump was gonna win and that he was gonna be reinstated in office in January 6th and then later and then in August and then in September, none of it ever comes true. But the minute they say it again, they go, mm, I have been hypnotized, I am for freedom. Uh, vaccines we've taken our, our whole lives for a whole host of diseases. I don't care about your stupid logic or your stupid facts or your stupid science or your stupid reason. I got an idiot right wing host brainwashed me and I'm smarter than all the scientists and doctors in the world. That's what the right wing voters say. I'm not gonna do mainstream media horse crap, okay? Well, I can't tell who's right or wrong. We all have to respect each other. And right wing, left wing, I can't, well, I can't tell, okay? No, all of the scientists are on our side. The doctors are on our side. The idiots are on your side. That's a fact. Let's talk about some idiots, shall we? Corey yeah. Lewandowski, remember him? Yep. Corey Lewandowski, he was of course Donald Trump's close associate and aide. He was recently fired over allegations of sexual misconduct. Now the PAC that he was involved in, Make America Again PAC, is having a makeover. And the collective geniuses came up with a new name for the revamped PAC. The new group dubbed Make America Great Again Again <laughs> will be led by former Florida attorney General Pam Bondi, a longtime ally of the former president. Kimberly Gofoyle, who is a former Trump campaign official and girlfriend of Trump's eldest son, Don Jr., will serve as the Super PAC's finance chair. The new Super PAC will effectively replace Make America Great Again action as the singular Super PAC authorized by Trump. Make America Great Again actions, all their net assets will be transferred to Make America Great Again again, the group said. Again. <laughs> okay, there, there's two uh, parts of this. One is they had to uh, set up a whole new pack. And so I was wondering why, what, what's going on? So they fired basically uh, Lewandowski from, from the earlier pack. Um, and, but it turns out Lewandowski's on the board. 
And Lewandowski's a right winger and a and a pretty vicious one. So he probably was like, no, I'm just gonna ruin the whole organization. I'm not getting off the board and you can't make me. That's my guess as to what's happening. So they're like, all right, now we have to rename the organization. We have to start a whole new pack and make sure Lewandowski is not on the board, okay? So that it just, this controversy with Lewandowski or the latest one with him just happened a couple of days ago. It's all the same people, Pam Bondi, et cetera. So they move over to the new group. And by the way, my God, this group for all you Republican voters, enjoy, send them money, I don't give a damn. They're gonna rob you blind. Donald Trump Jr. and his girlfriend and every scam artist in the Trump orbit is in this. They're all gonna get salaries, giant salaries. They're gonna use Trump properties and they're gonna, you're gonna pay rent on those properties. They're gonna be exorbitant. You're gonna love getting robbed by these people. So enjoy it, enjoy it. Send all your money because they, they gotta buy New properties, they gotta live off the high off the hog off of your money. So I don't care if they rob you at all. Send them the money, I don't care. They're gonna keep most of it, they're not gonna use it for politics anyway. If they, I thought they were gonna use it for politics, then I'd say, oh, well, then I'm concerned about you sending the money. No, my guess is they're gonna keep an overwhelming lion's share. Us progressives, we're suckers, we actually care about people, right? I started three different packs. You know how much I've taken from those three packs? Zero dollars, zero. Because it's actually about bringing change to people and actually helping people. Now, do you think Donald Trump Jr. and Kimberly Guilfoyle are gonna take zero dollars? Do you think Pam Bondi is gonna take zero dollars? <laughs> if you do, you're an idiot and a sucker. Go ahead, send them money, see how it turns out. They're, you know what? They laugh at you behind the scenes. They go, <laughs> these idiots, they're suckers and losers that send us money. And then we just keep it, okay? That's what they're gonna do, but enjoy. Now, the second part of the story, of course, is the name. That's the best you got. Make America great again, again. And, and by the way, David, it is the best they've got. I, Trump bragged about it the other day. He thinks it's a genius thing. MAGA again. Um, well, maybe this will also, you know, to enable them to do all sorts of other things again. Especially if Corey Lewandowski is anywhere near this. Um, since we mentioned it, uh, it was a GOP donor. Trishel Odom, who recently wrote in Politico about being sexually harassed, she wrote, on the evening of September 26 in Las Vegas, I attended a dinner to support a charity and spend time with wonderful friends. He repeatedly touched me inappropriately, said vile and disgusting things to me, stalked me and made me feel violated and fearful. Again, Trishel Odom, fearful again and again and again. <laughs> okay. They're like Joaquin Phoenix's character in Gladiator, you know, the villain. <laughs> again and again and again. So, yes, Lewandowski with another uh, sexual harassment one more time. And by the way, why did he get fired or, uh, or they tried to fire him at least uh, from the group? Um, because that was a donor. Before when he did the staffers, when he did to other people, oh, Corey, come on back, who cares? That's just regular folks, even if you're on our side, who cares? A donor, no, those are the holy people. You cannot touch a donor, you cannot talk to a donor that way, you're gone. That's a cardinal offense. But by the way, I'll say one last thing. Democrats have the opposite problem. Like, clearly the Trump people oversimplify with, you know, make America great again, 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 right? Uh, but Democrats come out and they speak in a language people don't understand. And they're all like, oh, subsection two, three of the clause, third clause shows you that we've had a precipitous decline and hence we must move henceforth to make this happen. Uh, people hate you, people hate you. Uh, so you could go a little simpler and the Republicans could have a thought or two. So by the way, the abbreviation for this is gonna be MAGA. <laughs> <laughs> Can we meet in the middle and not just be ruled by nerd bureaucrats that can't communicate to regular people and just cavemen yelling MAGA? In all caps, all caps with MAGA. <laughs> all right, David Schuster, everybody check him out on Rebel HQ. You guys are gonna love the videos, he's awesome. And when we come back, we've got another Rebel HQ star, Adrian Lawrence. Uh, and we uh, have amazing stories for you. 
Wait, what's my favorite one? I'm trying to find it for you guys. Now, of course, I have lost my piece and totally destroyed this tease. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Mike Pence. Oh, I love that story. The groveling from Mike Pence after uh, barely escaping execution. These are the insane times we live in. We'll be back. Again and again. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Young Turks. Support our work, listen ad free, access members only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, Cenk Uger, and I'll see you soon.